So let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, as uh, we gather today, I just ask you to be with us, to be with your word as it goes out. The people in this building would be touched by you, that anyone who ends up listening to this message anywhere, uh, instead of just hearing me, they hear your word. But uh, what you have to say resound within us and take us and encourage us, build us up, embolden us to whatever situation we find ourselves in, God, to be bringing your word. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so today we're going to talk about standing firm. And, you know, if you go to Ephesians, you hear about, you read about the armor of God. And that we put on the armor of God so that in the uh, attack of the evil one, we can stand. And after all that, to be able to stand. But that's the only place that we learn about staying on our ground or being firm. And what I'm going to share today is kind of a... I look at it as a really encouraging passage in Philippians. Um, it's one of uh, my favorite passages. The whole uh, chapter in Philippians 4 is fantastic. Um... But as we look at this, don't lose sight of how we get here. Paul is talking to a church, a group of born-again Christians in Philippi. So he's talking about people who have already learned that they need to call in the name of Jesus to be saved. That already know that they need to repent and seek forgiveness from God. And born out of these things is an ability to do what he talks about doing here in chapter 4. So I'm not talking about, I'm not taking this and, and saying there aren't other things wrapped up in what we need to do. But having accomplished some basic things, calling out to Jesus, like we see in Romans, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. There's no, I, I don't care what you believe out there, there's no getting around that the Bible says you've got to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. You've got to call out to Jesus for that. Yeah. Having done so, we also read in Scripture that we need to repent. That God is willing, wanting to forgive us. Forgive us. And when He forgives us, forget everything. But we have to initiate that. We need to repent and look to Him. Having done these things, we move to this. And just to, if you don't know the, the history of the church at Philippi, we're talking about a church that's under persecution. We're talking about a church where people are being jailed. Uh, people are losing their jobs and their livelihood. People are being shunned in the marketplace. And just all these things happening. And it's to these people that Paul writes. And I'm sure many of them, especially if you look at what a Philippian jail looked like, many of them probably died just from being put in those places. And this is what Paul writes to these people. It says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. My beloved. So we get this command, even in Philippians, even when persecuted, even when jailed, even when losing your job, even when losing your friends, maybe even your family. Paul gives these instructions. Stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in these things that, that have eternal significance, not just temporal, physical significance. why I hope during these times we're still reading our Bibles, still having communion with God in prayer. He goes on about uh, verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. How about that? He's not writing to people who are having good times. He, he is not writing to a city that, as Christians, that are just partying, okay? These are people that are getting beaten and dying for their faith. And he says rejoice, because, you know, no matter what we face in the world, whether it's some illness going on around, or whether it's persecution, like our Christian brothers and sisters face all the time in other nations, we can have things to rejoice over. And he says that we should be rejoicing, even in the tough times. He doesn't say that you don't have problems, because we have problems. Jesus said you're going to have problems. But he says rejoice, not in the problems, but rejoice in what happens on the other side of the problems. Rejoice in what happens during the problems. We can rejoice in a, in a Savior that is with us, 
The Bible tells us over and over again about the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us. We are the temple of the living God as believers. And having that, we have something to rejoice, to rejoice in. We have something to be thankful for. We have something that goes beyond what we see and touch and feel in here. We can hold on to that. In the toughest of times, we can hold on to Jesus. He has promised never to leave us, never forsake us. Mm -hmm. um, last week, we, we saw that in the end of Matthew, he promised to be with us even to the end of the age, the end of the world. That's something we can rejoice in no matter what we're seeing or feeling or hearing. He goes on. In verse 5, he says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. I do believe Christians should not be among those that freak out over things that go on around them. No. We don't need to be the people that run and scream in the middle of things. We're the people of calm. We're the people of peace. We're the people who think about things, who trust in the Lord, and find that right path to follow, even in the middle of chaos. Storms in our life, storms around us in the world, we are the ones they can stand firm and say, hey, wait a minute. I know a way through this. Or at least, as we go through this, I know who's holding my hand. We have an anchor in the middle of all of this in our Lord. And knowing that, and he's writing to this church that's persecuted, and said, knowing all the stuff that's going on around you, and knowing all that, I'm telling you, stand firm. Be reasonable. Think about things. Share with other people where your hope is. Be the people that other ones are looking at going, mm, how can they be calm in the middle of this? Make them ask questions, you know? And make them ask about why you aren't freaking out in the middle of stuff. Speaking of our faith and our hope and our love, this is another thing, verse 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This is one of my wife's favorite verses. She's got this one memorized. But I want you to think about this for a second. First, don't be anxious about anything. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. Anxiety gets us absolutely nowhere. A healthy respect of what's going on around you, hey, that's good to have. You know, knowing that it's bad to step in front of a bus, that keeps us from stepping in front of a bus. It helps us to look both ways before we cross the street. Those are good things to have. Having a fear that freezes you in place and makes it unable, makes you unable to act or do anything, that's not what God called us to. That's not what we're supposed to be about. Having an anxiety that wraps you up so bad that you're having health problems because of it. Carrying stress because of all the things you're worried about. God says, give it to me. Lay those things out onto him. Trust him. Commit those to him. I think one of the biggest problems we have as Christians is giving God things in prayer. Then when we stand up and move away from that prayer time, we pick those things back up and walk out with them. Leave them on the throne. Leave them right there before God and trust him enough to handle things. I mean, you give them to him, right? You're going to pray to him. Ask him about things. <clears throat> Trust him enough to leave them. That's what it says right here. With prayer and supplication. Supplication is just like this big word that means let him know what we need. So do that. Let him know what you need. And be thankful. You might think, what is there to be thankful for? Wow. <coughs> we got all kinds of stuff to be thankful for still in, in, in our nation. I don't know where somebody might hear this message, but and I heard once that if you don't have a gospel that preaches everywhere, you don't have a gospel that preaches at all. So let me share this one. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, there's something to be thankful for in having a God that loves you. Because the God that loves me loves you anywhere you are in the world. No matter what you're facing, whether you have a home or don't have a home, whether you're hungry or whether you're fed, God loves you. And there's an eternal life that he has for you if you ask Jesus to be your Savior. If you call out to him and repent. So yeah, this preaches anywhere and everywhere. In the ICUs, in the nursing home, 
in India, in China, wherever he sent missionaries, wherever you hear the word of God, this goes. We have something to be thankful for because Jesus died on the cross and he rose again. So there's always something there. Then he goes on in verse 7. He says, and that, now, just to tie it in here, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, he goes in and says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So a couple of things here. One is, our hearts and our minds are guarded, protected, watched over by this peace we have through Jesus. And we've talked about peace before, a, a cessation of conflict. We have an ending of conflict between you and me and God when we ask for forgiveness. We have an ending of conflict between us and the world as we rest in Christ. I do not have to go fight the world. I go out into the world with a message from God. And the Holy Spirit and Jesus do the fight. Any decision anybody makes for the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit's work in their life, hearing them and, and listening to, to the Holy Spirit. That is not me. That's nothing that I've done. Nothing you've done. We bring that word. That's our job. So we don't need to think about conflict when we're talking to somebody about Jesus. We're just sharing. The most important message anywhere. And peace comes when we stop thinking about it as conflict. Peace comes when we start giving things to God and leaving them there. Even that relationship that that, that, that person that you know is lost and you really want them to be saved. Man, that's not you that does that. It's not me that does that. It's God. So put it at the throne and leave it with Him. That's His work to do in somebody's heart. We bring a message. That's all we do. And I say here, we need to soak in this. And, and I mean that. Peace isn't something you get that you enter into with God in prayer and then you get up and you take on all the whole conflict again. That's not the peace he wants you to have. He wants you to have the same peace that you had at the altar in your home, in that quiet place, in that little war room that you've got. He wants that kind of peace for you as you walk in the world. But you only do that if you just like soak it up. If you spend time with him, if you spend time blocking out the other garbage and let him speak to your mind and to your body and to your soul so that you can get up and go out and you can be a person of peace in a world of conflict. Doing this will guard your hearts and your minds. And we come upon one of my favorite verses, um, what I consider the mental health verse for the Bible. Um, and yeah, I have my own mental issues. I really need this verse sometimes, okay? Verse 8 says this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So Paul takes a church that is being beaten and jailed and thrown out of society and says, think about what's true, honorable, just, pure, and lovely, commendable. Think about these things. And, you know, you don't have to be a theologian to understand the word. Now, there's a two-pronged, I, I think, um, application to what Paul has here. First off, we need to, every day in our life, we need to look around and find the true the lovely, the honorable, and the pure, and the commendable. We need to look for those things. Because the way our brains work, our brain is going to focus on the things it thinks we want. 
Now, if you start thinking about the negative all the time, your brain, not understanding what negative thoughts do to you, <laughs> is going to think you want negative. So it's going to put every negative thing you have in your life. And the next day you're going to get up, it's going to find more for you. And eventually you end up in this spiral of just, there's nothing good anywhere. That's not the truth. Truth is God loves you. Truth is Jesus died for you and rose again. Based on those, you have a way to be thankful. You have some positive, you have some true and lovely and honorable and pure and commendable right there. If you got nothing else. And working out from that, I'm betting if you just remind yourself of that a few times, and then step outside and look around you, there is something lovely somewhere. There is something pure somewhere. There's something commendable and honorable somewhere. And what Paul is saying to these people who have a lot of negative to look at, look for these things. Focus on these things because they are going to help you get through all of the problems. He doesn't say ignore your problems or don't deal with your problems. He understands fully. He went to jail in this city. He knows what they're facing. But we are not people, the people of God, we are not people that focus on the problems and live in the problems. <clears throat> we recognize our problems, we seek out solutions, we focus on God, and we follow him through the storms, through all the problems, through the stuff in our lives. And we keep on following until we end up with him in heaven. Now, if you're sick today, I, I, I can't guarantee you that God's going to heal you and make you well. Because the fact of life is, every one of us is going to die. Unless Jesus comes back for us first. That's just where it is. It's what you're going to be doing with this that you need to be thinking about. Even if you're in the ICU and you don't have any time left, you have time to reach out to God. Even if your friends are, are in the ICU, your loved ones are in the, the nursing home, and they're, they're struggling during this time, you can't be with them. You can pray for them. You can ask for God's peace for them. There are things we have that we can do. And it's not wallowing in our problems. It's seeking out these things that he's talking about. But the other end of that is, he also says, mentions these, true and honorable and just and pure, lovely and commendable, not just for what you should be seeking out as Christians, but for what you should let other people see in you. There's two ends of what he's saying here. You look for this. Allow these things and reach out to God in the middle of this to pull you up out of depression, to pull you up out of focusing on just you. And then, then you go be the one that is those things to other people. So we find the true and the honorable, the just, the pure, the lovely, and we hold on to that, and we praise God for those things. But then go and be that in somebody else's life. You be the one piece of truth maybe that they see. You be the one that has some honor among them that they find in their life. You be the one that shows them the forgiveness of God, the loveliness of our Lord. You be the one that shows them what justice really is by God's definition. Now, he says we can be justified. You be that one to show them. So, how do we stand firm? In this passage, we learn, one way we do it is we rejoice and we give thanks to God because if you're breathing, there is something to be thankful for. We pray. We, we're not getting through this stuff without talking to the Lord about it. We have got to be people of prayer. For 2,000 years, it's been that way. It hasn't changed a bit because of a virus. We must be people of prayer. And we let the peace of God guard our hearts. Hey, I want you to do things that are safe, and I want you to take the protective measures that you should. But ultimately, we need to put our trust, our faith, not in our government, 
but in our God. That's where it has to be. And we work through our problems, but we focus on our blessings. This is how we stand firm in the middle of everything. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that we're able to gather still. That through all of this, we've had the doors open and we've been able to meet. And I thank you for anyone that may see this anywhere and that lets you touch their lives. God, I pray that you take us out of this place to continue to be people of your love, your faith, and people who are guided by just wanting to share your word. Thank you in Jesus' name.